Now let's get to the heart of the matter and let's do some recording. So one of the key things you'll need to do is figure out a good way to start and stop recording for asynchronous lecture. When you're preparing a synchronous lecture, you may want to take several clips of the same slide as you're making. So you want to take one to two minutes per shot, okay? I favor local recording on Zoom, that means on your actual device, because there's higher resolution and you don't need to consume mobile bandwidth or network bandwidth to upload to the cloud. And actually, there are fewer layout options, and I don't think that's a bad thing. So the current layout option that you see in this video is that the thumbnail of your video camera on your laptop is being captured in the upper right-hand corner, and that the annotations are sort of being put in through the iPad that I'm using. The second thing that you really need to do is figure out how you're going to deal with no goods. All of the video clips that you've created that are actually you know, failed attempts to make that particular video for that slide or those set of slides. So you have to come up with your own way of dealing with this. Now one very helpful thing to do is use Zoom's own keyboard shortcut to do this. So if you press Shift, Command R, it will stop the recording and when you restart it by pressing the same button again, it'll generate an additional file. This way you can make multiple files that contain different takes of your individual shots and you can annotate the slides in some way, for example, holding up your hands like this for no good at the end of the clip or for example, putting a big X on the screen using your annotation device like this and that will help you understand that actually you want to throw away that clip. You want to make sure if you're using this particular shortcut sequence to wait a few seconds before start starting or stopping so that you can settle down because the Zoom recording system does take a little bit of time to start up and stop. Now, if you want your picture in picture to be shown, make sure you don't close the thumbnail. No matter where you uh, move the thumbnail to in Zoom, it will always appear in the upper right hand corner. So that makes it easy to figure out where to not put your materials. And nothing is more frustrating than forgetting to record something that was actually a good take. So make sure you have your recording on enabled on every new meeting. So the key feature of this video is a dual device approach. We're going to use your Mac as the Zoom host, and we're going to use a software pointer that allows you to use your trackpad to focus attention on the slide. But when you're not using your software cursor, you need to move it out of the way. Otherwise, this pesky cursor will be sitting on top of content. So make sure it's out of the way when you're not using it. So the second thing we're gonna do is connect our iPad as the second device that we're going to use. We're going to use our secondary free account and join our own meeting with the host as an observer. And this was going to allow us easy on slide annotations that we can get in a useful way. And now Zoom has capability that you can easily change what type of effect you want. So you can change colors. And you can also do pointing if you need to. So these are all enabled and the great thing about Zoom's annotation capabilities, it can work with anything. You know, you don't need to be using a presentation software. You could be browsing a website and you can still annotate your own screen. Now a key part of this is to make sure that your Zoom meeting is set up for shared screen annotation. So you can set this by default to allow annotation. The downside of this is that your students might actually play pranks with you and write on your screen while you are annotating it as well. So a natural question to ask is whether you should be using the annotation function or pointing with the software cursor on the Mac. Which means should you use? It's often messy to try to use both, and it's not usually a good idea because it confuses the messages for your learners. Our recommendation is to use the cursor highlight when you have pre-formatted diagrams, not like this one, where you would have lots of diagrams and you want to show a part-whole relationship, or when there's too much annotation that's easy to preview, there's too much writing. 
On the flip side of things, you might consider annotation as when you want to guide attention. So when you already have information on the screen, but you want to call attention to it. It also requires that you're paying attention because this type of annotation is not as easy or obvious to scrub as the cursor highlight. It's also good for giving persistent highlighting about the points that are important on the slide and slightly easier to manage because it just uses the iPad. You don't need to fiddle with the meeting controls and flip between, let's say, your Google slide presentation within your browser and the Zoom client that's uh, working on the host computer. Great job. Now that you've finished recording, it's time to go to post-production and look at what's the remaining steps to do. So a natural question to ask is why YouTube? And the answer is actually very simple. You, as well as your students, are already using this platform every day. So why don't we go where our students are already? The great thing about YouTube is it has very high discoverability and it has a suite of editing tools that help us as the content creators. Secondly, it also has free subtitling that it can be uh, enabled, and it does so for multiple languages, especially if you're not casting in English. One of the big downsides is it's a commercial service, obviously, and so you'll need to check your school's licensing policy to make sure that what you're doing is okay with them. If you need to, you can choose a Creative Commons attribution by license by looking for the video details and choosing under more options to switch the license to Creative Commons. Now, both the editing as well as uh, the subtitles come in slowly. So after you upload the video, it may take a couple hours for those to appear. So don't be worried if you try to edit your materials right away and you can't find the appropriate switch. Now the great thing about YouTube is that you can edit it directly in YouTube Studio. If you've made a cast and you have a relatively small amount of edits to change, you can split and trim the segments directly in YouTube by going to the studio interface and choosing to edit. It'll give you this black interface as you see below and you'll be able to uh, hit the trim button here which will provide you with a large blue rectangle which you can then change the slides uh, to shorten or lengthen parts of the clip and split the clip into multiple parts if you have a, a dead segment in the middle, for example, here. Many times, if you've gotten used to shooting a synchronous video, you'd like to be able to, to have more control over multiple clips. And then it's not really viable to do it in YouTube Studio any longer, and you're using YouTube mostly as a distribution network. Then you can try to do offline editing using QuickTime. QuickTime allows you to join multiple clips together and save them as a new video. And you can rename each of the clips by a sliding, uh, starting slide number, such as like this, so that you can save the content and reorder it or reshoot parts of the video as necessary and then combine them together again for a later batch or cohort. There are two other tips that I want to give you. First, that titles matter on YouTube. You want to make your subject matter come first. So put any branding about your institution after the subject matter that you're treating in your lecture because long titles or file names often get truncated. And also add a clear title slide at the beginning because YouTube might be able to detect that as a video thumbnail for your lecture. And this will help your students download the file and find the correct one. The second thing you might wanna do is create a playlist. Create one and fill it with your course description so that it'll be easier to discover when somebody types in keywords from the course into YouTube. Timestamp the cohort at the top, for example, the January 2020 term, so that the viewer will know whether this is the current iteration or previous one that they're looking at. All right, congratulations, you've made it through the video. So let me leave you with a couple last thoughts. First, again, to recap, why a synchronous lecture? It's because when we have live lectures, we can force our students to attend and we can capture their attention. We know they're looking at us. But there has a lot of limitations and we need to really embrace the digital technology and what its affordances are, right? Basically, we have to be looking at lectures on 1x speed but we don't even know whether they're attending because they could be doing Facebook or Instagram or any other medium. 
So we're not really sure they're paying attention to anyways. And with online content, we can have analytics, even within YouTube, about which lectures are looked at, which lectures are reviewed, and which parts of a video are hard to understand. And so we can tune implicitly without our students giving us explicit feedback, which part of our lectures to improve upon. So although this is the case, if you look at Bassif online open courses, many of those courses, even though they've shot the asynchronous videos, they want all the students to go through a cohort at a time. And why is that? Because if you have a cohort at a time and you make the videos only available for a short period, everyone is watching the same videos at the same time and it generates this type of in-classroom discussion where everyone on a discussion forum can discuss the same topic, which is really key to having a good uh, user satisfaction from our learners. So our best practice is to encourage people to watch within a certain time frame and to offer, for example, evaluation milestones that need to be completed at a certain time. I'd also highly recommend if you're going to do more advanced video editing where you want to provide a script um, and read from the script in advance to use Otter AI for generating transcripts. It's very helpful to do that and transcribe your, what you're going to say on a first run and then refine it and shoot it again um, through a script. And Otter AI is really good for, for example, multi-party dialogue if you have another um, lecturer interlocuting with you. I'll leave you with this final resource, which I think is really great. And it comes from the Science of Learning Research Center at the University of Queensland in Australia. They've come up with 12 psychology, education, neuroscience principles or PEN principles that help guide you about how to do your online lecture most effectively. So for example, to try to combine visual information that comes from slides as well as your spoken word well so that you can have reinforcement in your lecture rather than competing for attention. And that's it. Thanks for watching this video. And if you've got any questions or better practices, please share them in the comments, either here in YouTube or on the Google slide deck. And I'll try to improve the slide deck and perhaps reshoot parts of this video. And as a side, if you think this is interesting, I can also perhaps share with you how I use GitHub pull requests to pull in student contributions into collaborative documents on GitHub IO, as well as holding student-led synchronous seminars, where as the instructor, you can annotate the students as they're presenting, again, using Zoom. Thanks for watching and happy video lecturing.